Hey there, YouTube. Myron Golden here. And today I am going to share with y'all a concept on the timeless thesis of God. What does that even mean? It means God is eternal. And I've always, I, when I was a kid and I started reading the Bible when I was 16 or 17, it was the first book that I ever read. And, and, and interestingly enough, that was not a comic book or a karate book. I read some comic books. I read some karate books. Didn't read books for school. I'm a slow reader. I've always been a slow reader. So after I came to Christ, my a friend who led me to Christ, he said, now you need to start reading the Bible, and I was literally horrified. And I was horrified not because it was the Bible, but because it was reading, right? And, and reading has just always been labor for me. I was the kid, and you ever, when you went to school and you had kids read in front of the class when you were learning how to read, and like one kid would get up and they'd just read everything like they'd been reading since they came out of the womb, and then somebody else would get up and they'd read, and it was like they were stumbling all over the page and all the kids would laugh. I was the one they were laughing at because like, I, I, I felt like I was chasing the words all over the page, trying to make them sit still so I could read them. And, um, and so when he said, I, you, you need to start reading the Bible, I was horrified until I started reading it. And when I started reading it, I started seeing these principles with promises attached to them that if you do this, then you can expect this, right? And, and I started buying into the idea that if, if I do this, then I can expect you know, X, Y, Z. And so um, that was pretty amazing. And I saw time after time after time, like people say, well, how do you know there's a God? Can you prove there's a God? No, I don't, can't prove there's a God. I can't prove it. I don't need to prove it. He's already demonstrated. He's already proved to me that he is who he says he is, right? Because when I've done things that didn't seem to make any sense, they worked anyway, right? And so um, I have a lot of people ask me uh, in business settings, they'll say, Myron, how do you have this, like you have this sense of certainty that's like unlike anybody that I've ever seen. And like, where does that come from? I've even had people say, so can you teach that to people? And I can't teach it to people, but I can tell you where it comes from. And it comes from like the confidence that I have is not confidence in confidence. The faith that I have is not faith in faith. The belief that I have is not belief in belief, but the confidence that I have is confidence in the one who cannot lie. The faith that I have is faith in the one who is faithful and cannot lie. The belief that I have is the one that's believable and cannot lie. That's what it's based on. It's not based on, I've just conjured up, I've just conjured up this, oh, I'm, I'm just envisioning good things are going to happen to me. I'm just envisioning good things are going to, I think that's probably a better way to do it than I'm just envisioning bad things are going to happen to me. That's probably, right? So th that's a better way to do it. But like God has demonstrated throughout human history that his word is truth. You want to be blown away? You want to be blown away by the timeless nature of God? Read the book by Rabbi Jonathan Kahn called The Oracle. It'll blow your mind because it will show you, it will sh like the things that are in the Bible that were prophesied down to the specific day that they happened thousands of years before the people who did those things were even born. Which means, in order for that to happen, the person who had the knowledge to put that in a book before it happened by thousands of years has to exist outside of time. And so I'm going to read a passage to you. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. And when I think about all of the similitudes and the, and the significance and the analogy, and then the fact that these were real people, in this passage, it just, like, it's, it's like, like, what am I doubting? What do I have to doubt? So understand that God came to Abram. This is Genesis chapter 15. God came to Abram in Genesis chapter 12 and said, look, if you will get out of your country, out of your father's house, away from your kindred, he said, if you will do that, if you will leave the land of the familiar, what I will do is I will make you the father of many nations. Now, why is that important? Because Abram's name, before it was Abraham, his name was Abram. The name Abram means high father. But Abram was a high father who couldn't have any children. And when God came to him and told him that, he was 65 years old. His wife was 55 years old. They didn't have any children. And God said, if you will, if you will leave the land of the familiar and journey to the land of faith, Abram says, okay, Lord, I got a question for you. Where's the land of faith? You will know when you get there. I will show you that you are there when you get there. Not I'm going to show you how to get there before you get there. I will show you that you're there when you get there. God was showing Abram that I want you to trust me, not because you know what I'm saying. I want you to trust you because I want you to trust me because I want you to know who's saying it. 
Okay, and so he comes, so he says, if you will leave, if you read Genesis chapter 12, you'll see in the first couple of verses, he says, he says, if you'll leave the land of the familiar and go to the place of faith, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to bless you in ways you can't bless yourself. I'm going to give you things you can't get yourself. I'm going to make you something you can't make yourself. I'm, I'm going to take the source of your shame and make it the source of your fame. I want you to think about that. What was the source of Abram's shame? So, so. We name our children names that we like the sound of, right? Oh, I like the name Taylor. I'm going to name it, right? Bible names were not just names that the people like the sound of. Bible names were descriptions. So Abram's name meant high father. So every time somebody called his name, the 65-year-old man whose name is high father, he knows he don't have no kids. His wife knows they don't have no kids, and everybody who knows him knows this is the high father with no children. What if that was your name, right? What if your name showed everybody who you weren't? Can you imagine the anguish of soul of like having a name that is a misrepresentation of how you do your life? And so God says, if you'll leave, I'm gonna give you that. So 10 years later, Abram's 75. He still don't have any children. 10 years after God gave him a promise. Now, 10 years to me is a long time. 10 years to a 10-year-old is all the time they've experienced, so it's everything they know. 10 years to a 20-year-old is a 10 years to a 20-year-old is half of their life. 10 years to a 60-year-old is one-sixth of their life. That's why time moves by, feels like time moves by slower for children than it does for people who are older, right? As you get older, it feels like time is going faster, but it's not going faster. It just represents a smaller portion of your life, the older you get. How many of y'all, how many of y'all tracking? Okay. So God comes to Abram and tells him you're going to have a child at, 50, at 65, and at, at 65, and at, uh, at 75, he still has no children. How many of y'all would begin to doubt in 10 years? If God gave you a promise, this is what I'm going to do for you, even if you heard his voice audibly, like Abram did, 10 years, I don't know. Sarah, Sarah you, you, do you think I really heard God or did you think it was just like I was imagining things, right? What, I mean, isn't that the kind of conversation you'd have? And so God comes to Abram in Genesis chapter 15 and reminds him of what he already promised him 10 years ago. And so if 10 years is all there is to a 10-year-old and half of what there is to a 20-year-old and one-sixth of what is to a 60-year-old, to God, there's no difference between 10 years and one second. It's all the same. Because he, God lives outside of time in eternity. Are y'all tracking? So he says, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, fear not, Abram. Fear not, Abram. Fear not, Abram. What would Abram be afraid of? He'd be afraid I'm going to die with no children. I remember I was at a Funnel Hacking Live conference in 2016 uh, in San Diego, California. And... No, it wasn't. It was, um, it, was, it was somewhere else. I don't remember where it was because they have them all over the place. But it was, I think it was 2017, and Tony Robbins was speaking. Now, there's 3,000 people there. I'm sitting there minding my own business with my son and my daughter and my wife, and Tony Robbins is speaking. And Tony Robbins points at me. Sir, I want to ask you a question. <laughs> me? And he asked me a question that was so hard to answer because it's not, the question that he asked me was not, the answer was not something that I've really ever entertained. He said, so tell me the two things you fear the most. I literally could not think of anything. I literally, <laughs> not, I was more thinking like, why are you talking to me right now, bro? <laughs> right? Because the year before, Marcus Lemonis, the prophet, he was speaking at the one in Funnel Hacking Live and he picked on me and asked me a question. I'm like, do I have a sign on my head that says, pick me or something? And so I remember saying, um, I don't know, I, my greatest fear in life is that I'll die without grandchildren. And my name's not even Abram. So can you imagine a 65-year-old man, I mean, a 75-year-old man, that's, that's 14 years older than I am now. He has no children. God comes to him and says, fear not. Why is he telling him to fear not? Don't be afraid that the promise that God gave you is not going to come to pass. It doesn't matter how long it's been. In time, it feels like, in time, 10 years feels like an eternity. But in eternity, 10 years feels like no time at all. Are y'all tracking? He says, fear not, Abram. 
I am thy shield. I am thy shield. I am thy shield. It's really interesting. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. He did not say, I was your shield. He did not even say, I will be your shield. He said, I am your shield. We're going to come back to that in a minute. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. What is God saying? I am your protection. I am your provision. By the way, that is like we, God could like God could say the same thing. That that's the very same thing to me today. I'm your shield. I'm your protection. I am your great reward. I'm your provision. What does it tell us in Psalms chapter forty-six, verse one? It says, "The Lord is our refuge and our strength. What a very present help in trouble." Therefore will not we fear though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled. Be still and know that I am God. Like God said, look, like just, just sit still because I am everything that you need for the, for the sustainability of your life. Okay, cool. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? Watch what he says seeing I go childless, and the steward of mine house is this Eliezer of Damascus. So what, Abram just told us what he was afraid of. What are you going to give me? What are you going to give me so I can know that what you said is true because I am childless, and the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in mine house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, thou shalt, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad. God brought Abram forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven. Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. Can you count the stars? That's what your seed's going to be. Your seed is going to be like the stars of the heaven, like the sand by the seashore. Just the sand at the seashore Clearwater Beach would be a lot of seed, but all the seashore, that's a lot of folk. And this is a 75-year-old man with no children. This is, one of the, this, is, this is like one of the greatest promises of all times. What is God showing? God is showing Abram, look, I can be trusted, but it'll be easier for you to trust me if you stop trying to time me. Because your late is my right on time. How many of y'all tracking? And so um, Abram said, what are you going to give me? I, this story is so cool, and I'm taking way too long on it. So, but I'm gonna, I, it's all good. It's all good. And so, um, and he brought him forth, if you, if you can be able to number them. And he said, so shall thy seed be, verse 15. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. He believed the Lord and he counted to him for righteousness. See, see, God does not count our righteousness as righteousness. What does he count our righteousness as? According to the scripture in Isaiah, our righteousness is as filthy rags. So we can't do enough good deeds to earn favor with God. By the way, that's not a new thing. That's an old thing. That, like, God didn't save Abraham because Abraham did good works. God saved Abraham because Abraham believed God. And when we believe God, like God still saves people today, same way. You believe God. What, believe God about what? The death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Like, it's not baptism. It's bapti and I, I know people get all hung up on that. Baptism does not save anybody. What does baptism do? Baptism is like the wedding ring to people who get married. It just shows that you're married. It doesn't make you married. Somebody who's single putting on a wedding ring doesn't make them married. Somebody who's married taking off a wedding ring doesn't make them not married. Somebody married who never put on a wedding ring doesn't make them not married. Baptism is a sign. It is not, it is not the, the signifier. It's just a sign. It just shows. It's not the thing that makes it so. Are y'all tracking? Like the good deeds that you do and the tithe that you give and the helping people, old people across the street. If I need help across the street, please help me. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, I'm just saying, if y'all see me struggling getting across now, don't, don't, hang, don't hang up on a brother. Okay, so, so, so know that the reason God saved Abraham is the same reason God saved anybody who's ever saved, and that is because they believed him. 
Because if God will lie about anything, he's already lied about everything. Okay. He believed God accounted for him righteous. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the earth of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? He's like, I hear you. I hear what you said. I heard you 10 years ago. Show me something. Please show me something. I need a sign. And he said unto him, take me and have her three years old, a she-goat three years old, a ram of three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto them all these and divided them in the midst. And he laid one piece against the other, but the birds he divided not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun went down, and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And then it says, and he said unto Abram, <laughs> whoa, 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 time out. You're going to put Abraham to sleep, Abram to sleep, and then you're going to start talking to him? How many of y'all know, generally speaking, if you have something to tell somebody, it's better to wait till they wake up to tell them than it is to wait till they fall asleep to tell them, right? But it says, it says, okay, I think I read that right. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I did. Fowls came down, verse 12. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, know of a surety thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and they shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. Can Abram hear this? No, he can't hear. He's asleep. So why is he talking to him? Why is he asleep? Is that a good question? Right? I mean, I know preachers put people to sleep and then start talking to them. That's different. That's different. I know seminar speakers put people to sleep and start talking to them. That's different. This is God. So there's a reason he put Abram to sleep and started talking to him. But wait a minute. There's, but wait, there's more. And then, so serve them 400 years, verse 14. And also that nation whom they will serve will I judge. And afterwards they shall come out with great substance. Now, God is telling him something's going to happen way down the road. How can he know? Because he lives outside of time. Are y'all tracking? And then he says, thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and they shall be buried and, and shall be buried, in a, buried in, a great, in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. The Amorites were the descendants of Canaan who, who inherited the, who were already living in the land of Canaan. The Amorites were, the Amorites, the Hittites, the, the Girgashites, all of those ites were the descendants of Canaan who were living in the promised land. And God said, I'm going to give this land to you. And in the same day, uh, uh, and then it says in verse 17, this is the verse, y'all ready? Verse 17, and it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. What just happened? Here's what happened. God put Abram to sleep and started talking to him because he wanted us to know that we don't have to hear what he said in order for him to keep his word. He has to hear what he said in order for him to keep his word. If I don't know what God said, that's not, God said, I'm not going to let myself off the hook because you don't know what my word says. I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do because I am the God who cannot lie. Not who does not lie. Can't, can't do it. God, can I get you like, can't do it. And so he said, it came to pass when the sun went down in his dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. So we, if we understand the picture, Abram is asking God to show him a sign that he's going to keep his word. What was the sign that God showed Abram? He said, I'm going to enter a covenant with you. Why? Because when two people enter into covenant, and I know some of y'all have seen this before, but when two people enter into covenant, they would stand, they would stand, each, they would stand facing each other, right? They would lead an animal to the place of covenant. They would kill their animal here. They would cut it in pieces because the word covenant means to cut. Okay? That's what the word covenant means. It means to cut. He would kill, this person would kill his animal here. This person would kill his animal there. They would cut him up in pieces. They would, this person would walk around in a circle, come back in the middle. Oh, actually, when they started, they were back to back. 
Sorry, they, when they started, they were back to back. When they came back, they were face to face. So when they started, they were facing opposite direction, back to back. When they came back, they were face to face. This person walks around in a circle, walks around the carcass of this animal in a circle. This person walks around the carcass of this animal in a circle. They come back in the middle, face to face. They, while they're walking around this animal, they're observing the brutality of the death of this animal, observing the brut brutality of the death of this animal. They come back in the middle, let's say, um, these two people, they would come back in the middle. Let's say, this is, if this is God and this is Abram, they come back in the middle, they take a knife in their left hand, cut their right hand, put their hands together, bind it together with a rope, uh, bind it together with a rope. They exchange covenant vows. So if, if um, um, let me see, I'm looking for somebody whose last name I know, Larry. So Larry and I, were going to enter into covenant. We exchange covenant names. My name would become Myron Larry Golden. His name would become Larry Myron Destine, right? So we would exchange covenant names. We'd exchange covenant promises. The covenant promise is this. I am going to keep, I, I'm going to do everything, Larry. I got you. I got you six. I'm your guy. If you ever need something, like your car breaks down in the middle of the night, call me, right? You broke as a joke, ready to choke, call me. I'm broke as a joke, ready to choke, I'm going to call you, right? I'm going to give my time, my effort, my energy, my wealth, my resources, my wisdom, even my life if necessary to protect you and yours. He's telling me the same thing. So God's getting ready to go into covenant with Abram. What's the problem? Abram's in double jeopardy. What's the double jeopardy? Well, first, if he enters a covenant with God, he's going to come back in the middle. He's going to be face to face. He's going to have to die. Die. What, what's the other problem he has? He can't keep the covenant. Abram can't do it. Like Abram, because he has a sin nature, he cannot keep covenant. Because you have a sin nature. You can't keep covenant. So, so... It's no wonder God doesn't accept religion as a propitiation for sin. Because our good deeds aren't good enough. And the good deeds that I do in the future won't outweigh the bad deeds I've done in the past. And the good, good deeds I've done in the past won't outweigh the bad deeds I'll do in the future. I'm, I'm, I'm hopelessly trapped in a sin dirt suit that I have to do my best to yield my mind to God and yield my body to my mind so that I will live more along the lines of doing the things that God desires me to do. Not so God will accept me, but because he already has. How many of y'all track and wave at me, my peeps? And so what happens, Abram's in double jeopardy because number one, no man has seen God at any time and lived. So he's going to be face to face with God. He would have to die and he can't keep the devil. Now he's got to die again. So that's double jeopardy. Now we know why God put Abram to sleep. Because Abram needed a substitute to take his place in the covenant walk. What's the substitute? Notice what it said in verse 17. It came to pass that a smoking furnace. Y'all didn't know I was so artistic, did you? Watch what I did. What, you don't even know. Brother man can draw fire and all kinds of stuff. Came to pass that a smoking furnace and a burning lamp So they put olive oil, they put olive oil in here, right? And then they stick a wick in here, and then they light a can, they light that lamp, and then fire would come out. That fire was better than that fire, but you already knew that. Okay, so, so it says, it came to pass when the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between those pieces, those pieces of what? Those pieces of dead animal carcass that God told Abram to come to bring and kill and cut into pieces. Are y'all tracking? Why? Because... Abram, God's still entering a covenant with Abram, but what he's doing is he put Abram to sleep so the burning lamp, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and the smoking furnace, that's God the Father, passed between those pieces. So God said, the son, just like when we received Christ, the son said, okay, if Abram doesn't keep the covenant, may what happened to this animal happen to me. God says, if I don't keep my promise to Abram, may what happened to this animal happen to me. God's going to keep his covenant. Abram's not going to keep his covenant. Abram needed a substitute that knew he couldn't keep the covenant, that was willing to walk the covenant in his place anyway, so that Abram wouldn't be in double jeopardy. 
And so you wouldn't be in double jeopardy. And so I wouldn't be in double jeopardy. And that's why God doesn't accept anything except the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter what your religion is. It doesn't matter what religious beliefs you believe. Religion is just something Satan inspired man to create so that humans could try to hold other humans hostage by making them think you've got to be more like me in order for you to get to God. Hedonism is the first religion in the Bible. It's in Genesis chapter 3. Humanism, what was it? Well, that man becomes God. What did Satan say? If you eat the fruit that God told you not to eat, if you disobey God, that will make you more like God. Wow. Every other religion is a derivative of that. But see, God never established a religion. You know what God established? God established a relationship. And a way, God, est- God created he, creation, connection, and contribution. He cre- did creation. What happened? God created creation and created creatures. What happened after that? He created, he created, because he couldn't connect with creation, he couldn't connect with creatures, he created man in his own image. So he created creators that he could connect with, but the creators that he created severed the connection that he had with them. Now he's back to square one. So what do he have to do? He had to give a contribution in the form of the death, burial, and resurrection of his son to pay the price to reestablish the connection. That's the whole, that's like, that's the whole life, that's the whole story all about what God's initial intention was. We messed it up. He restored it. How many of y'all track and wave at me? Okay, so now here's what's interesting. If, if, if God is willing to make a covenant and his covenant is truth, Aleph, Mem, Ta, Mem, Tav, that's how you spell truth in Hebrew. Aleph Mem Tav, it spells Amet, Amen, Amet, Amet. What is Amet? Amet is Aleph Mem Tav. What does it sound like? Amet. What does it sound like? Amen. Let it be so. Oh, I get it. So Aleph is the letter that represents God. Mem represents the might of the ocean. Tav is a cross or a covenant. So what is truth? Truth is God's, I don't need to write it there, God's mighty covenant. What's God's mighty covenant? Well, God's mighty covenant is truth. By the way, if you attempt to separate God from truth, like this, this word right here, memtav, would be spelled M-E-T-H, met. Guess what? Guess what this word is? Death. What? If you attempt to separate God from the truth, all you have left is death. Isn't it amazing when we had started kicking God out of society, how death began to multiply? We kicked God out of our schools, and now instead of having the Ten Commandments in our schools, we're teaching children that they came from an animal, and so now we got all these school shootings, and people are trying to call it gun violence, and there's no such thing as gun violence. Like gun violence, that's, that's the language they use to trick you because there's not a gun that's ever been manufactured that was violent. It's actually people violence. (laughs) And people use guns to commit violence. So there was a guy who lived in Pennsylvania, and he and his wife got in an argument. He ran over her with a car multiple times, intentionally, and killed her. Nobody ever called that car violence. Why? Because it wasn't the car that did it. It was the person who used the car to do it. How many of y'all tracking? Right? So you say, Myron, what's your, what's your point? When we remove God from the truth, all we have left is death. But that's one thing it shows. Guess what else it shows us? If God doesn't keep his word, then God himself has to die. And if God dies, everything ceases to exist. So literally, the reason I can count on God's word, I didn't even get to the I am part yet. Wait till we get to that. The reason I can count on God's word is because God cannot lie. Because if he does, the whole thing goes kapooey. This is so good. So what should I do? The psalmist said in Psalm 90 verse 12, so teach us to number our days. Why? That we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. There it is. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Hmm. So here's 
God made man in his image. But we're not exactly like God. Because God operates and exists in the opposite realm that we operate and exist in. We operate and exist in the realm of time. God operates and exists in the realm of eternity. Without beginning, without end. It's hard, like we can't comprehend that. You know, you know why it's hard for us to comprehend eternity? Because everything we experience in life is bound by time, space, and matter. So when somebody says eternity, I don't really have a way to envision eternity. I could say eternity is like a circle. It doesn't have a beginning. It doesn't have, well, that one does. That's a terrible circle, man. Um, so it doesn't have a beginning and it doesn't have an end. It's just a circle. Where does it start? It's always been there. Where's it end? It's always been there. But the interesting thing about the difference between time and eternity is this. Eternity does not need time, but time needs eternity. What is it? Okay. Let me, let me say it a different way. In time, in the realm of time, there's no such thing as the present. This cannot exist in the realm of time. It can't. Why? Because as soon as I say now, it becomes what? Then. So the present is an ever-evaporating, expiring non-existent in the realm of time idea. It can't, like now can't happen. In time, in the realm of time, there is only the past and the future. Wrap your mind around it. Here we go. Y'all ready? In the realm of eternity, there's only the present. There's no such thing as the past or future. How can God know the end from the beginning? Because to God, there's no difference. He's outside of both of them. He's outside the past, he's outside the future. So what's a moving picture to us is a snapshot to God. Now, somebody says, oh, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, well, it, it does. Because God made us in his image, and so we can't do everything he does, but we can, do, we can do things similar to what he does so we can understand better the things he does. So do we have any filmmakers in here? Anybody ever... A couple of filmmakers. Okay, cool. So let's say our two filmmakers are going to make a film. You're going to do a feature film. You're going to do a feature film. You write it. You produce it. You direct it. Right? Um, let's even say you star in it. You're the, like, you are the leading actor, leading actress. Y'all ready? You create this movie. You hire all the actors. You create the film. And then you go to watch the premiere. Who created the movie? I did. Let me hear you say I did. I did. Who created it? You did. You created, y'all two created the movie. Okay, cool. So y'all created the movie. Do you know what's going to happen before it happens? Yes. Do the people who are, the other people who weren't in the movie watching the premiere, do they know what's going to happen before it happens? They have no idea. So it unfolds in real time for the people who didn't create it, but it's already been unfolded for the people who did. <laughs> There's no difference between the beginning of the movie, the end of the movie, and the middle of the movie to you. When the movie started, it was already done. In fact, before it started, it was already done. And then after it started, because it's captured on hard drive or film or tape or disc or whatever, it still hasn't been done for the people for whom yet it hasn't been done. Now, we can do that as people, but we think God can't do that, and he's way smarter than us because he created everything out of nothing in seven days, and in all of that knows the end from the beginning because it's all just, it's his thing. God exists outside of time. That's why when Moses, God called Moses to his assignment. Moses had a hard assignment too. Abraham had a hard assignment. How many of y'all know you got a hard assignment? Like, like, to all of us, our assignment feels challenging, right? That's why it's an assignment, because we have to grow into it before we can go into it. And so God calls us to the space, to an assignment, that when we see it, it is clearly bigger than us. Hey, Moses, 
who, 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 me, 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 yeah, you. I want you to march into Pharaoh's office and you tell him I said, let my people go. But I can't talk good. Did I ask you how you can talk? See, here's what we think. We think our limitation is God's limitation. The limitation in our ability is the leverage point of opportunity for God's ability. It's what's missing in me that makes room for God, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Everything good that I have is a gift, therefore, the fact that I can see is a gift, the fact that I can hear is a gift, the fact that I can read, the fact that I can think, the fact that I can operate a business. Like, I can walk around and be proud of it and act like I did it if I want to, but if I do, I miss the point. It's all a gift. How exciting is that? That's like the greatest news ever. Go tell Pharaoh, I said, let my people go. Can I ask you a question? Sure, ask me a question. Who, 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 who? Who, who, who should, 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 should I say s- 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 sent me? <laughs> I read that. I was like, Moses, bro, come on now. That's the best you got? Like, if you're going to ask him a question, ask him a question, bro. Like, like I want to coach Moses. Like, when I read that story, I want to say, Moses, look, here's what you ask him. <laughs> Moses, I, like, here's, here's what I would ask. Can you please tell me what you said, what to tell him you said you're going to do if he says no? That's what I'd want to know. (laughs) Moses didn't say that. You know what Moses said? Who shall I say has sent me? What did God say? I am that I am. What does that mean? I am is the ultimate identity. What does I am mean? I am that God. What God? The very present God. I'm the God of eternity. I'm the God who operates outside of time and controls time, and therefore, I know what's going to happen before it happens because I created it to happen exactly that way. Wow. I can trust God because he's the one who set the whole thing up, and nobody knows how it works better than he does. I am limited by my experience. God is unlimited because he has unlimited experience. And so, when we understand the nature of God, the nature of God is this, that he exists in eternity because there's not enough room for him in time. If you're going to hold something infinite, you have to hold it in an infinitely abundant space. And so God operates in time, reigns from eternity. And here's what he's showing us in his word, the same thing he showed Abram. While you are operating in time, stand on the foundation of eternity and you will not fall. And just like he said to Abram, I am your protection. You don't have to be afraid of enemies. I am your provision. You don't have to be afraid of lack. The greatest news of all times. God is eternal, and that's why his name is I am that I am. Not I was that I was, not I will be that I will be. I am that I am, the one that exists outside of eternity, the one who is worthy of all of our, all of our yielding, the one who is worthy of my life. and Everything that I do, it's all his anyway. I'm just doing with it what he told me to do with it. So when I give it to him, I'm giving back to him something that became more than it was before he gave it to me. Are y'all tracking? So yield to the one who is the I am that I am, and then your I am can become the I am that he created it to become. Because God is the ultimate identity. And until you know who he is, you will never fully understand who you are. Because all authority flows out of identity. I don't know who I am until I know whose I am. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for watching. Thank you for liking and commenting and sharing. And I appreciate y'all. And we'll look forward to seeing you in the next video. Peace out, Cub Scouts.